If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. So we've been doing these episodes where we just specifically talk about one topic. And one topic that continues to pop up is how do I get a faster metabolism? Uh, this is a big one. And, and there are strategies that you can employ to speed up your metabolism. And they really work. We've done this with clients for, for decades. I've been doing this for two decades with people. And it never ceases to age me how much faster I can get someone's metabolism. And there's three basic things you need to focus on. And these are the things that we really get into detail and depth uh, in this episode, really break it down. So the first thing is you want to get stronger and you want to build muscle. So we get all into the best way to lift weights to speed up your metabolism. There's a lot of different ways to lift weights. We talk about specifically the best ways to do it to speed up your metabolism. Then we talk about diet. There is a way to eat to speed up your metabolism. And in a nutshell, it comes down to slowly increasing your calories. That tells your body, hey, it's okay to burn more calories. But there is a specific way to do it. There is a strategy. We break that down as well in this episode. And then finally, sleep. Sleep plays a massive role in your body's ability to burn calories, burn body fat, and build muscle. And again, we give some of our strategies in there. And in there, in part of the strategies, we also talked about uh, the benefits of blocking blue light if you are going to be on electronics before bed. And studies show that that does improve sleep quality significantly in most people. Now, we do have a company that we like that we work with that offers the best blue light blocking, blocking glasses that we found. The company is called Felix Gray. So it's Felix, G-R-A-Y. And the website is felixgrayglasses.com forward slash mind pump. You'll get free shipping and free returns if you go through that particular link. Um, and now, before I get in the episode, I do want to tell everybody that our MAPS HIT program, this is our high-intensity interval training program, is 50% off all month long. In order to get that discount, go to mapshit.com. That's M-A-P-S-H-I-I-T.com. And use the code HIT50, H-I-I-T-50, 50, no space for the discount. And if you want to look at our other MAPS programs, let's say you're interested in speeding up your metabolism like uh, this episode talks about. The best metabolism speeding program we have is probably MAPS Anabolic. You can find that program and the other MAPS programs at mapsfitnessproducts.com. So when I think of like some of the most paradigm shattering moments um, in my fitness career, I would say when I would get this client and it took me I don't know, probably 30 plus, maybe more that I would get that were severely overweight. Like we're talking a hundred pounds or more overweight. And I'd sit down with them and they would tell me what they would eat. And they, it, this general, I'm, I'm over generalizing this, but it would be like a bagel for breakfast, a chicken salad for lunch, you know, and then another salad for dinner and they're like 100 pounds overweight. Oh, yeah. And I might have a Diet Coke. And I remember, as a trainer, I remember thinking to myself, like, this bitch is lying to oh, me Oh, right I know yeah. exactly. And I, re and, and, I, and I remember just going, getting frustrated. Like, I cannot believe that they think I, I'm going to fall for this. And I feel really bad because there's a lot of clients that probably blew right out the door mm -hmm. because I was just certain that they they were lying to me. There's no way this person could be... Yeah. Didn't this, add up. this overweight and eating 800, 900 calories a day, you know, and it wasn't until way later in my career did I start to piece this together. Like, man, this something's going on here that these people really do have this slow of a metabolism. I was in the same, I had the same exact experience as you, Adam. And part of it is because a lot of people do lie or not lie, I should say, people under report. Right, or unaware, right? Yeah, they're just not aware, and, and so more often than not, that's what happens. Somebody, they'll tell you, oh, "I'm only eating this much," but then when they go and actually weigh and track, they come back, and you and it's it's you're like, "Okay, there it is. There's the real numbers." But like you're saying, I've had that situation, and for me, it wasn't an obese client. For me, what it took for me to learn what you learned, I had to train somebody who was super active, working out all the time. Mm -hmm. Somebody that uh, ended up becoming a workout partner of mine uh, for a little while. And she was 
she was very honest. She was very, very mm-hmm. honest with me. And so we sat down and she showed me her, her cow. And I knew she ran something like 20 miles a week. So she ran like crazy, mm-hmm. took Pilates, did other classes. And then she lifted weights with me twice a week. And she showed me her food stuff, her, her food logs. And I knew her. So I knew she wasn't lying. And I looked at her food logs. And I'm like, you're consuming 1,500 calories a day. This, is, doesn't, this doesn't seem right. Right, this, and you're running 20 miles a week. Yeah, there's no way this yeah. doesn't seem right. How long have you been doing it? So when you look at her history, and this is how I pieced it together, she had yo-yo dieted half her life, was always had a problem with weight. So she'd cut calories and, and, and move like crazy to lose the weight over and over again. So this was after years and years and years of doing this. So that's number one. Number two, I believed her because I knew her personally. So I'm like, okay, she's telling me the truth, but this is crazy. So I did some research and I would I read this article on um, prisoners of war, people who are captured by uh, you know opposing uh, countries or whatever. And these people would survive for years on like, a few hundred calories a day. Now, of course, they were malnutritioned, they were malnourished, but the fact is their body survived off of 300 calories in some cases a day for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, okay, the, the, and everything else I'd learned up until this point was like, the human body can adapt. Has her ad- metabolism and body adapted in such a way to where it's just hyper, hyper efficient? And um, that was when I really started taking it serious because up until that point, I didn't believe people. Yeah. And, you know, I started to piece together exactly what you did, which is that it seemed more and more common in these extreme situations where, you know, you had you would fall out of shape. And when you were out of shape, you were either sedentary or you weren't moving a lot. You weren't exercising You were over consuming on calories and then you would decide, okay, it's time to get in shape. And you would go the complete opposite. You would try and restrict as many calories as you could because everybody told you calories in versus calories out. Mm -hmm. And so you would reduce the calories as much as you can and you would try and go as much exercise as you could. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, they would do this on and off multiple times per year for many, many years and now have found themselves in this position where, they're 30, 50, 100 pounds overweight. And they're eating a normal amount. Yeah. And they just yeah. can't, and they can't, can't lose it. And not even a normal amount. A lot of times it's eating low, low. That's, like you're saying, like 1,500 calories. Not, I saw 900 calories. I saw calories on bodies that just didn't make sense to me. Well, and it's always been hard. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had a client who had, you know, seen really good results and had, you know, got there by an extreme amount of cardio. And also just completely, just constantly um, scaling down her calorie intake. And, you know, this got almost a hundred pound loss and then came to me and then was now trying to uh, lift weights and maintain this. And it, it just inevitably, it became uh, a really delicate situation where she's not eating very many calories now. I mean, there's like, you know, a thousand and below on a daily amount to where even just like a hundred calorie uh, would, would, you know, fluctuate and it would mess with her to where now, like it was, it was so delicate to where her, her weight would fluctuate all over the place. Well, once I figured this out, it changed how I trained people forever. It, it, it really, really did. And regardless of who you were, if you came to me and your goal was to lose weight, uh, my first goal with you was to speed up her metabolism. But right. I think before, because sometimes we forget um, that a lot of people who listen to the show need to learn like some of the basics. And so I think it's important we talk about the metabolism first a little bit. Yeah, what is it? And what it is. Now, this, the, if you look it up online, the scientific term is it's the chemical process that occurs in an organism to maintain life. Now, metabolism, you know, animal metabolism is one of the most complex things that we know of in the universe. Probably second only to the brain. The brain, right? So to say that we know exactly what it is, uh, I, I don't think we know that. But in the context of fitness, from what we're talking about, the, when we refer to the metabolism, what we're talking about is your calorie burn that happens on its own. So outside of you trying to move more to burn more calories. It's like, how many calories does your body burn 
kind of on its own just to maintain itself. So, right. right. When you, there's, there, everybody has a, uh, you know, a calorie maintenance or your, your BMR, which yeah, is your basal metabolic rate, which is you could lay in bed all day long and never move and the body will still burn X amount of calories. And then what we do exercise wise increases that. And now there's going to be a huge individual variance based off of a lot of different things. Right. And genetics play a role. Some mm-hmm. of us have a, a more natural, quote unquote, slower metabolism. But I think that's where uh, a lot of people go wrong. That's right. Is, you know, we, they they see maybe passed down generation like, oh, you know, my mom was overweight. My dad was overweight. My sister, everyone in my family is overweight. And so they assume that they just have this bad, these bad genetics. They have mm-hmm. a slow metabolism, and then they're stuck with it for That's the rest. That's the of card their life. they were dealt, right? But in reality, the metabolism is this free flowing thing that is affected by many different things, and that we too can manipulate this and actually increase it. No matter how slow of a metabolism you've started with, you can ramp it up and and make it into a a, a thriving metabolism. Like most things in the human body, the metabolism adapts and it adapts to the signals that it's being sent from you and from the outside world. Now, why would the metabolism need to adapt? Well, uh, do humans always have a consistent amount of uh, food in front of them? Well, for most of human history, no. Most of human history, it varied dramatically depending on the season um, and if you were a successful hunter versus if you weren't. Um, so it, it, it adapts and it moves according to the signals that it's being set. Now, that's important to understand because if you understand that the metabolism adapts and changes, then you can start to approach your metabolism or your, your goals with that in mind and think to yourself, look, if you're, if you're listening to this podcast right now and your goal is to, like most people, is to get leaner and stay leaner forever, what do you think is going to make it easier for you? A na- a slow metabolism, one that is thrifty and efficient, that doesn't burn a lot of calories, or one that is fast, that is burning lots of calories? Well, in the context of modern life, uh, in other words, if you live in modern Western societies and you have food all around you and you're just not that active, a faster metabolism obviously is going to help you out. Now, if we go back 1,000, 10,000 years ago and you're living, uh, you know, hunt by hunt, you are you don't have food, you don't have grocery stores all around you, it probably wouldn't be beneficial to have a hyper fast metabolism all the time because you just don't have that much food. But today, a faster metabolism just makes it uh, much easier. Now, when we talk about fat loss, uh, it's, it's really it boils down, it's, it's more complex than this. But it really boils down to an energy imbalance. Are, are you burning more calories than you're taking in? Or to put it differently, are you taking in less calories uh, than you're burning? If that happens, your body makes up the difference by uh, tapping into its stored energy, which is body fat. That's what body fat is. It's, a, it's, like, you're, it's like a bank. You're, you, know, you, you put extra money in the bank and save it there just in case where well, your body does that with body fat. So when you're taking in less calories than you're burning – your body's going to burn it from your body fat. So it only makes sense that burning more calories is going to make that much uh, easier. Now, the problem is when people understand that whole, you know, oh, I got to burn more calories and take in less calories type of deal, they consider the the, the manual calorie burn that happens from exercise. Versus the automatic. Yes. They're not looking at their their, their own natural, their, their own metabolism. What they're looking at is, okay, I only have an hour to work out three days a week. Which one's going to burn the most calories? You know, is it going to be running on a treadmill? Is it going to be using an elliptical? Is Which, it going to well, be? Yeah, this is the interesting part because, you know, there are formulas out there for, for finding your basal metabolic rate. And there's ways of trying to organize your thoughts around, um, you know, where I'm at currently in terms of like, where do I burn? How many calories, like, you know, generally do I burn throughout the day? And, and uh, also, what am I consuming? So those are two very important things to track and to, to watch. However, it's again, like you had mentioned how it changes. And so this is something that 
um, you know, don't live and die by these numbers, but have it, you know, accessible so you can kind of learn more about your own tendencies and your own habits. Well, right. you know, talking about the manual and automatic, and I, I, I get beat up a lot by academia by using this these numbers. But for me, it was very game changing when I remember reading uh, a study on this a long time ago, and it was just referring to when we add muscle, for every pound of muscle that we add in our body, our body burns X amount of calories. And so there's a lot of argument and debate what that number what is. What that number precisely is. And so but we I, do know that you add muscle, you burn more calories. Right. Yeah. And so I used to use uh, the a generic number to give people that example. I mean, there's I've seen studies to show as as low as, you know, 20 calories a day for every pound of muscle to as high as 60 and, you know, give or take. So I used to tell people, okay, so figure for every pound of muscle that we can put on the body, the body burns an additional 50 calories a day. So if I could just add five pounds of muscle to your body, that means your body is needing 250 more calories a day. That's a lot of calories mm -hmm. right there. And that's just from five pounds. And that doesn't mean that we have to see five more pounds go up on the scale because we what we can do is we can actually lose five pounds of body fat, add five pounds of muscle to your body, your scales stay about the same, but your metabolism completely change. Yeah, look at it this way. If you owned a business, um, what would be a better strategy? That you do everything in your business? That you run the front desk, you run the back, you do all the numbers, you do all the sales, you do all the mark, you do everything on your by yourself, which requires an incredible amount of energy and time and dedication, or you get the business to run itself. If you want to make fat loss easier and make it more permanent, why not get your metabolism to work for you? Like at, like the example Adam gave of 250 calories. People think, oh, 250 calories, that's nothing. No, 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 no. That's like doing 45 minutes of cardio every day. Yeah. Imagine if you burned enough calories to equate to 45 minutes of calories, uh, of 45 minutes, excuse me, of cardio every single day, except... You're just doing your everyday normal stuff. That's the difference between approaching your fat loss and approaching your goals with the idea of I'm going to make my body adapt in a way to burn more calories automatically versus I'm going to try to burn all these calories on my own. Now, why is this important to understand? Because inevitably, you're going to be left with, you're going to be facing this choice. Do I do the workout that burns more calories? Or do I do the workout that speeds up my metabolism? And the one that burns more calories is cardio, lots of cardio. Mm -hmm. But the one that speeds up your metabolism better than any other form of exercise is lifting weights. Yeah. There's nothing that comes close to lifting. Now, why, why does lifting weights speed up the metabolism? This is an important uh, thing to, to, to explain here. We're focused on building muscle. Well, well, we have to talk about lifting weights properly, by well, the way. Not there's a, ways to do it that, not only, that Not only that, but every time that we lift weights, we send a signal to the body that says we need more muscle. Mm -hmm. And what's nice about that is that you lift weights and then now after the next 24 to 48 hours, your body is going to prioritize some of the calories that you consume towards that, mm -hmm. where it's instead of it being stored as body fat. So right away, you're already, you know, doing something so much better for your body for, in terms of speeding the metabolism up, because now that I'm lifting weights, not only do I get the, the calorie burn benefits of while I'm lifting mm -hmm. weights, which is similar to the calorie burn benefits you get for running on a treadmill, but then I get the added benefits of the next 24 to 48 hours where my body is prioritizing some of these calories to go towards building muscle. Now, think about it. This is an important, before we get into the, the best ways to lift weights to speed up your metabolism, because that's going to be important. Because I know sometimes people are like, oh, cool. They said lift weights, and then they go do the wrong type of weight training routine, which is uh, not going to give you the benefit. But before we, we get into that, I think it's important to understand why you need to give your body a reason to have a faster metabolism. Remember, for most of human his history, humans have been uh, living in states of scarcity when it comes to food. For most of human history, food was not readily available at any given moment. And in order to get food, especially calorically nutrient-dense food, you had to expend a lot of energy. Hunting was not like you go to the grocery store and you pick up some meat and you pay for it and you leave. You had to chase that shit down. You had to kill it with your bare hands. Then you had to carry it back. So it was our bodies 
did not speed up their metabolisms unless it absolutely thought it needed to because doing so meant you had, you increased the demand uh, on your body in terms of how many calories yeah, you, you need. You had to conserve that energy. That's do you, right. Do you think this is why this is so challenging for people because this is relatively a new message? Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, like, would you think like in 100 years we'll look back and it'll be like absurd that we even have to have this conversation? Well, I mean, having a slow metabolism, mm. context matters, right? Because we're not even talking about 100 years because you're, yeah. you're talking, you're going all the way back to hunter-gatherer, but even just you know, before the Great Depression, so like that it wasn't like there was food on every corner. There You're wasn't right. fast food. There wasn't DoorDash. And people there were active. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was. Yeah, exactly. You had to go walk at least to go get your food, and you had, <laughs> right. to, you had to kill it and make it yourself. Yeah. So we're talking about something that hasn't been as big of a problem. Yeah, we don't have to expend a lot of energy if we don't want to anymore. Right. No, so I can go. This is a relatively new message when we think about this. It is, and so you have to give your body a reason to speed up its metabolism. Otherwise, its default will be to slow down. And one of the best reasons you can give your body is, hey, I, you need to get stronger. Mm -hmm. You need to build muscle and get stronger. Because what happens when you lift weights is you create, uh, you send an adaptation signal to the body. All exercise does this. And your body tries to get better at, at whatever you know stress that you're placing upon it. And, and resistance training or weight training is a stress. So your body, it does this kind of like, if you imagine like, Imagine a boardroom with in a meeting, and it was your body talking to the other parts of the body that are running things. And they're like, "Hey guys, uh, okay, we got this muscle damage happening. It seems like yesterday we were really pushing things that were heavy and lifting things that were heavy. Uh, we need to get stronger because if we don't get stronger, that stuff's going to hurt us and it's going to break us. And the rest of the body's like, okay, right. it's a specific type of stress or insult versus like the other one where you know we, we had to really expend all this energy to get." places and we had to like carry things and move it was all about endurance versus you know if, if you keep telling the body that you know you're gonna have to overcome this uh this stress this 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 force that's you know pushing you yes and, and this load that you have to like uh you know overcome that's a different signal you're sending the body this signal is everything this that's is what it. we're talking about that's it the, the the best way to lift weights to speed up your metabolism because not just lifting weights won't do it there is, has to be a particular way, or there is a particular way. The best way to lift weights to speed up your metabolism is to get stronger. Like literally get stronger to where you can lift more weight. In my, now, it's not a guarantee, but in my opinion, my experience, that's the best metric I can right. use when measuring, are you lifting weights in a way that's going to speed up metabolism? Now, some people might think, well, okay, so that's great. So why don't we get the benefit of both at once? Why don't we take weights and put them in a situation where it's it's cardiovascular, but I'm also lifting weights. That will now. That's a great question because a lot of people say that, right? Well, what if I well think burn it, calories too? Do you have to think of it like this way? It's a spectrum, mm -hmm. and there's cardio all the way over here on the left, and then there's weight training all the way here on the right. And if the best way to speed up our metabolism is to be as far right as we can, which is build muscle, lift weights, get stronger, you want to be as far right as you can. That's right. And trying to combine weights with cardio. It falls more towards this cardio side, mm. where your, your body, which is the opposite of what we want. Competing messages. Yeah, because your body then is thinking, we need to get a little bit stronger, but we also need a lot of endurance. And endurance uh, doesn't require a lot of muscle. Um, it burns a lot of calories. And so the body's always trying to get more efficient. And so it may actually not speed up its metabolism. It may uh, maintain or even slow down. I've seen people slow their metabolisms down with weights as well, because all I do are circuits over and over again because they just want to burn lots of calories. So there's a caveat to this also, though, that I think is important to to talk about because it is one of the hardest things for me to overcome when I'm trying to help somebody speed their metabolism up is if you've also starved the body to death where you're eating such low calories for such a long period of time and then you go to build strength or build muscle and you don't also increase some of your calories, of course. you also tend to be spinning your wheels. And yeah. that is a really tough thing to, to tell someone, look them in the eyes and say, I know, Susie, right. that you are trying to lose 50 pounds and I'm going to tell you that. Eat more. Yeah, I <laughs> want you to eat more calories. Panic sets in, right? Right, and that's a really hard message yeah. to get across. Yeah, So because because you're trying to fuel the faster metabolism or fuel that signal. But you know, before we get into that, because that's a very important point you just made, Adam. You 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 can't diet and try to speed up your metabolism. You have to g let your body know that there's food, there's ample food. Uh, you're not you know at a calorie deficit. You're going to fuel the extra muscle that you're building. But before we get into the food part, because that's where it gets technical, like when it comes to weights, there's 
uh, the best way to do it. Get stronger. What does that look like? That means you're doing compound lifts. You're focusing on barbell and dumbbell movements. You're trying to get stronger at the big gross motor movements, deadlifts, squats, rows, bench presses. You're doing uh, straight sets, meaning you do your set, you do and rest. your 8 to 12 reps, you rest. You rest for a minute and a half, two minutes, let your body fully recover, lift weights again. The goal is to come back the next week and add two pounds or five pounds or a rep or two to each of these exercises. If you can add weight to your big gross motor movement exercises week over week, you will almost always see a rise in metabolism. In fact, when I have uh, one of the most common emails and, and messages I'll get are from women who do MAPS Anabolic, because MAPS Anabolic is a very build muscle metabolism boosting type routine, right? They'll message me and they'll be like, I'm starving. Yeah. I'm so hungry right now. I, I'm, in, I'm at week number three. My appetite Great went up. Great sign. I'm like, oh, did you get, I'll always ask them this. I'll be like, how much stronger are you? Oh, I added 15 pounds on my squat. I added 20 pounds on my deadlift. That's why you're hungry. Your body is, it's burning more calories. Mm -hmm. So now it's it's saying to you, eat more food. Um, so now I think we can get into the the you know the, the second most important well, thing. Well, one last thing before you move on to that, it, you know, because we you just kind of glazed over uh, something that I think is important. Why one of the reasons too, when you first sent over Maps Anabolic and we first met, that I thought it was absolutely genius. Um, and the part that I thought was so genius was that you chose to start the first phase in a strength, a type of five by five type of blocks. Mm -hmm. And why I thought that was so smart is, uh, and there's exceptions to all rules here, but the client that I've dealt with this the most is my my female client who has done high intensity stuff, high reps, supersets, circuit type training, low calorie. And one of the best things that person could possibly do is to go the op complete opposite mm -hmm. end of the spectrum, which is long rest periods and heavy weight mm -hmm. and only five reps and working sets like that. So a a five by five or a MAPS anabolic phase one type of phase mm -hmm. is an incredible place for this person who is trying to speed their metabolism up to start. Yeah, your goal is to, to your goal is literally, you know, look at these big gross motor movements that I named earlier. Bench press, squat, deadlift, overhead press, barbell rows. Look at those big gross motor movements and your goal is to be able to lift more weight each week. Am I getting stronger each week in a low rep, whether it's you know six reps or even higher reps, eight to 12 reps, am I getting stronger? If you're getting stronger, you are doing better. Not, am I sweating more? Am I, my, am I more sore? Am I getting more of a muscle burn? Forget all that. Am I getting stronger week after week? If you're getting stronger, then the high odds are you're lifting weights in a favorable, favorable way in the context of getting your metabolism faster. Now, Adam, you, you talked about eating more food. Here's the thing. If I'm sending signals to build muscle, like we're talking about, sending sig and, and then the side effect of that being a faster metabolism, but I'm not feeding my body more food. Ain't going to happen. Yeah. My body's thinking to itself, sorry, yeah. uh, you know, at the yeah. end of the day, survival is more important than yeah. we're, being good. We're at in famine mode. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you have to also s eat a little bit more because simply eating low calories sends a signal to your body to slow its metabolism down. That's, in fact, the primary signal that'll tell your metabolism to slow down is by eating low calories. So let's talk about what we do here. So when I get somebody like this, and this is, this goes back, and this is why it's going to be very individualized for the person, right? So the first week or two weeks, I'm tracking, and I want to see where they're at because I've seen as low as eight, 900 calories to upwards of 2,700, 2,800 calories, all of which I'm trying to help build their metabolism. Like your point, Sal, almost anybody that comes to me and their goal is fat loss, the first thing that we do at the beginning of our programming is to build the metabolism. Mm -hmm. So we're going to increase calories even if you want to lose weight no matter what. So, But I need to find a baseline first. And so the very first week to two weeks, it's all about tracking. And this is not you know, impress your trainer or, oh, this is day one of my new diet and so you're changing things up. No, this is the first week of getting started towards your program or getting started in this direction is let's see what I've been doing. Let's mm -hmm. see what I've been doing consistently. Eat normal, 
track it and figure out where your kind of caloric maintenance is. What mm-hmm. is keeping, and my, when I tell this to a client, I say, okay, for the next, and 10 days is about what I like to do. So I say the next 10 days, Susie, what we're going to do is eat normal. I don't want you to try and overeat. I don't want you to try to undereat. The goal really is to kind of maintain your weight. We don't want to see your weight go up or down, fluctuate too much. All right, my goal is at the end of the 10 days that you weigh the same today, and I want to see where your calorie maintenance is. So and that'll give you their... Yeah. Their metabolic rate. How right. How many calories You want to see what they're comfortable, you know, like the, what range of calories are already like, this is a good fit for me right because Right. Because what I know I'm going to do is I know that I'm going to increase their intake slightly. Yeah. And I just want to go slightly because what Sal was mentioning, we can send signals all day long to build muscle, but if we don't give it the nutrients mm-hmm. it needs to build, it's not going to build the muscle that we want to. It's not going to speed the metabolism. So we can't be afraid of increasing the calories, even though our ultimate goal is to lose weight. Right, and in fact, before you even get into that, during that ten week period, excuse me, ten day period of tracking, because that's exactly what I would do. I'd go seven to ten days. In that period of time, you're already starting to lift weights to build your metabolism. Mm-hmm. So, so the weight starts first. Start lifting, get stronger. Start with the first one or two weeks and just track. Keep your calories the same. You might even notice your appetite go up. Now, after that first ten days. Now you have your baseline. Now you know, okay, I'm going to go up from here and start real slow. And I would all, and this is different from person to person now because some people I would bump them 50 to 100 calories a day um, and that would be perfect. Other people I could get away with bumping up as much as 150 calories a day. I like the slow approach. That's my my personal right, opinion. Right, you can always add more later you on. You can always add more. And I would typically, and I'm not sure how you did this, Adam, but I would typically keep someone, if I bumped them up 100 calories, I would keep them there for about two weeks before I would try bumping them again. Yeah, my, my goal at this point is that I don't, I still, I still want to stay on that goal of not really seeing an increase. Although, I'm okay with seeing a pound or so, a pound to two pounds going up on the scale, more so than I want to see one or two pounds go down. Mm. So if I'm on my, now we're on to our second week of training somebody and we've kind of figured out their baseline. I've now told them, okay, Susie, you were eating 1300 calories. I now want you to go to 1400 calories. And by the way, I typically like to go towards protein as the the calorie increase, oh, yeah. just because most people that have the slower metabolism, most people that need to build muscle are also grossly under eating protein. So I normally will ask that the extra 50 calories to 100 calories comes from a good protein source. It's also more satiating. Right. And it's got a higher thermogenic effect in right. the sense that when they compare diet to diet and the calories are exactly the same, the higher protein diet tends to promote more fat loss, even if the calories are the same. And that's because, again, remember the metabolism is a very complex thing, Mm -hmm. but it's because protein itself causes the body to burn more calories than other macronutrients. Right. So I want to see them, I want to see them increase by 50 to 100 calories coming from protein. And I want our scale to stay about the same or potentially go up a tiny bit. I do not want to see a a decrease. If Mm -hmm. I see a drop in the first week or two, I'm training someone to build their metabolism. You bump it even faster. I bump it up even more calories. That's my sign. And it's, that's a great sign. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's like, oh, this is great. Your body's responding. You're lifting weights. It's wanting to build muscle. It is building muscle. Metabolism speeding up. Let's feed it some more calories. And the, the, the hardest part, and this is the part that people are, that will be challenged with is the mental fuck. You've Mm got to be okay with knowing that you're not going to see the scale move very much in this first month, maybe even two Mm -hmm. months, maybe even longer for some people. This is also why I encourage, like for all my clients, it was a Friday photo. And this Mm -hmm. isn't for me. This is for you. This is for you to be able to look at four weeks have gone by and Coach Adam has not allowed you to lose any weight on the scale. And you can look back four weeks earlier and see what your body looked yeah, like. Your body's still changing. And I will promise you, you will see a difference in the way your body looks. Even if the scale looks the same. Even if the scale is the same. And that me and though that tells me is we're on we're in a really good place. Mm-hmm. We are reducing body fat and we're slowly building muscle at a nice exchange. And that means that metabolism is slowly ramping I, up. I tell you what, too, this is what I notice. So people sometimes, oftentimes, would have a, a, a struggle with knowing that they hired me and I told them, we're not going to try to lose weight for the first couple months. I'm going to speed up my metabolism. At first, people freak out, right? Because yeah. they're like, well, that's 
all I want to do is lose weight. I finally made the decision to work out. I finally made the decision to hire a trainer, and you're telling me I can't. The ones that I could get their minds wrapped around the fact that we're going to speed up their metabolism and get them focused on getting stronger, it actually made it way easier when it was time to finally cut calories. Because by that point, they'd been consistent with their workouts. They'd been consistently tracking, looking at their food intake. By the way, bumping your calories up during this process doesn't mean you're eating crap. Mm -hmm. it, you're eating healthy. That's the other thing too that I think it's important to note is when I would look at when I would look at their diet and I would speed it and I would boost their calories a little bit to speed up the metabolism within their calories within their food intake. I would start to clean things up a little bit. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I would start to take out heavily processed foods, which just make you want to eat a lot anyway, mm -hmm. and typically aren't as healthy. And I'd start replacing with whole natural foods. So although they're still eating. 2,000 calories, and that's what they were eating before, whatever that was, the food breakdown is a little bit different and it's healthier. Now, that sets you up really, really well later on when you have a faster metabolism, you've already been working out for a few months lifting weights, and your goal has been all about getting stronger. Now, when we go to cut, it is way, way easier. You've, you've got everything working for you, and the odds that you're going to stay lean are so much higher. In fact, the only clients I've ever had who've lost weight and kept it off permanently, which is a hard thing to do, are the ones who who did this approach. The other ones, who Yeah, and it's interesting. Never. I mean, obviously, the, the toughest sell is that you're not going to be losing, you know, what you come in there, you want to lose weight. Like, right. that, that right. is a mind fuck. But at the same time, if you are able to now eat calories that will help energize your workouts and make you feel great during your workouts, like, that's, that's huge. If you can get them to focus a little bit more on that and, like, how they feel stronger and how they feel more energy throughout their mm -hmm. day, you know, that's a big highlight in the very beginning of this process for them to then shift when they have to yeah. go to cut. This is what I would say. So, you know, Adam just said, focused on pro focus on protein as the, the macronutrient you're using to boost your calories. Um, so here's the thing. Aim for about 0.8 to 1 gram of protein per pound of lean body mass. So figure out what your lean body mass is, because if you're trying to lose weight, then we don't want to use your, your total weight. Um, and, and aim for about one gram of protein, just to make it even. One gram of protein per, per, lean, uh, uh, per pound of lean body mass. And every time you bump your calories, keep it at protein until you hit that number. Once you hit that number, so let's say your lean body mass is 100 and you're bumping your calories. This is your first week of bumping your calories. Now your protein grams are up to 70. The next time you bump your calories, add protein again. The next time, add protein again. When you hit finally hit 100, then start throwing in more fats and more carbohydrates. But prioritize the protein because that's what's going to fuel the muscle. That's what's going to fuel the strength. That has a higher thermogenic uh, ability. It burns more calories on its own. It's more satiating, meaning it's more filling. People eat more protein, they tend to eat less calories. So, so prioritize that macronutrient as the one that you're going to use to boost your calories until you get to that number that I just gave you, at which point then you can start adding things like carbohydrates. I also think fats. there's some good generic st strategies with things like carbohydrates. I typically, you know, um, I, one, I, I like a balanced type of a meal, unless you have some sort of autoimmune issues. If all things are normal and you can eat carbohydrates and you're fine, I like to have a nice balance of carbs, fat, and proteins where I'm not, you know, I don't want to restrict too much from this person. Right. I'm trying to encourage a good relationship with food. I want good balance. I recognize that at one point in their life, they're going to want a glass of wine. They're going to go out to dinner. I don't want to go ketogenic. I don't want to do these types of things. I want a good balance. But there are some strategies towards how and where I have them eat carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. I personally like uh, either one, one of their meals in the morning. So their first meal in the morning time will have a little bit of carbohydrates in it. Uh, I love to lean towards things like oatmeal or fruit, stuff like that to start their day off. And then I try and time uh, the rest of their carbs pre and post workout. And then the rest of the the rest of their meals, those are going to be higher protein, higher fat. So like a couple hours, an hour or two before the workout, right. and then right after the workout. Right. So that mean. right. So that I get the I get the benefits of the fuel for that that workout. I'm also refueling the uh, my my glycogen levels right afterwards. So that's kind of where I'm going to try and gear them towards. I think those are good habits for the average person to have, and then also to train them that on days that we are not exercising, that if we were going to reduce our carbohydrate intake, that would be the day. But I, all in all, 
I want a good balance of all the three major macronutrients because I think for most people, I think that's a more ideal long-term way of living um, unless, again, like I said, you have some sort of an issue that you can't. Yeah, and so you're looking at you know every maybe week or every two weeks, you're going to be slowly bumping your calories by about between 50 to 150, depending on the individual, depending on how many total calories you're eating. If you're really scared about gaining lots of body fat, while you're doing this, what's called reverse diet uh, with your weight training, then bump them slowly, 50 calories a day this week. And then, no, oh, I check the scale. I'm doing the workouts. I'm getting a little stronger. The scale, you know, it didn't really go up or only went up a pound or it stayed the same. Cool. I'll try another 50 next week. You can do this slowly. It doesn't have to happen. In fact, it's probably better to err on the side of slow than it is to, you know, dramatically increase your calories because that could cause all kinds of other problems. So uh, there's also a lot of benefit because we're, and I know this isn't as much in the eating more, probably could have fell into the exercise portion of this conversation, um, but we didn't really address neat um, or just walking around and moving. Sure. There, there's, you know, there's something to be said about good habits like this. It, one of the best habits that I've created for myself and my clients um, is, you know, we, we've gotten to this place where we sit and we eat, we sit at a TV and we, we eat food. We sit down at a restaurant for an hour at a time and eat food. And then we plop down on a couch or get in our car and just promoting movement, not exercise, not training, not running on a treadmill, just after meals, going for nice walks. Like this, this will promote the digestive process and help that process. And I think overall that this helps speed the metabolism up. If you're somebody who eats tons of food and then sits down and doesn't move, that can't be ideal and beneficial mm -hmm. for the body. So getting into good habits of going for a nice stroll after every time that you consume food, I think is a really good healthy habit for this person. Yeah, too. they find it increases uh, or improves insulin sensitivity and, and contributes to a healthier hormone profile, which mm. we should definitely talk about one big, big uh, rock yeah. uh, that we're not addressing because we, we're addressing about slowly increasing calories lifting weights to get stronger, but there's one thing that will- The ultimate recovery yeah, weapon. There's one thing that'll make all of this go to crap if you don't do this very well, and that's get really good sleep. Oh, man. This, yeah. this is one that This we, is the Achilles heel of this. Oh, totally. This is probably, again, when you talk about paradigm-shattering moments or like big ahas as a trainer, um, you know, I may get all these other things right, and I just, I was not a trainer who really addressed and looked at sleep in my first probably five- five to seven years until I realized how uh, detrimental it can be to somebody who neglects that. Um, I attracted a lot of CEO type clients and high performers and, you know, struggled with getting fat loss with them and didn't realize how much sleep was really mm -hmm. hindering that. Well, when you look at, again, if we talk about adaptation of the body and we look at evolution, the it's it's likely that the the well there's two types of stress that we kind of experience uh, in life. There's acute stress, which is typically something really scary or dangerous happening right yeah, it's now. It's not very cute. Like I like I almost got run over by a car. Oh my god! And then oh I'm safe. I'm okay now. Or you know for yeah. most of human history, it was probably a predator or an attack of some sort. The other type of stress that we experience is that kind of low to moderate, you know, consistent level of stress that just kind of stays with you all day long. Now today in modern times, that's, you know, traffic, it's a stressful life, it's not getting good sleep. But back uh, for most of human history, if you had this kind of low to moderate level of stress, it meant two things. It probably meant two things. It probably meant I don't have good shelter, so I'm not going to be sleeping well because I don't feel safe. And it meant I didn't have a, a, a reliable, steady source of food. Mm -hmm. So it only makes sense that if your body is is feeling this low to moderate level of stress, which lack of sleep does, lack of sleep promotes this in the body, your body's going to want to do two things. Hang on to calories, and it's going to make you want to eat more of the types of foods uh, that encourage you to want to eat more. So what you'll notice, and studies show this, people who lack sleep tend to crave uh, highly palatable foods makes mm. them feel better. They tend to eat more sugar. They tend to eat more uh, of the stuff that's not necessarily good for you. And they find that people, when they lack sleep, their bodies tend to not want to burn body fat. It's so. And and here's the here's the other thing: poor sleep is terrible for uh, your hormones. And what I mean by your by terrible is it creates a hormone profile 
that is not beneficial to building muscle and burning body fat. It creates a, a profile that's great for giving you energy now, which is kind of high cortisol, and not building muscle, not getting a faster metabolism. So you want to talk about shooting yourself in the foot, don't get good sleep, boost your, boost your calories and work out to get stronger, and you're probably going to be spinning your, t your, your tires in the dirt. So some of the things that we should address and talk about then are what are some of the things that you guys have because this is a hard one, like to get mm -hmm. to get people to get good sleep. Like, uh, I, I mean, you, to try and get me when I was in my early twenties. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I used to say things like, oh, "I'll sleep when I'm dead," and sleep mm -hmm. is overrated. <laughs> that was I, my favorite. Oh, yeah. I used to say shit like that. It's terrible when I think back. And but I I know that I'm not alone with with that mentality. I know there's a lot of people that think this way when they're grind. They take a lot of pride in grinding. Mm -hmm. So, what are some things that you guys have done? to uh, implement good behaviors around sleep with your clients? Oh, so the first and most important thing is to treat sleep like something you prioritize, like anything you prioritize. So let's say, for example, uh, I'm going to go do a talk and uh, I'm going to present to 500 people. If that was something that I took seriously, I would prepare for the talk. I would treat it very seriously. I'd make sure that morning I woke up and I looked over my notes. I would have made sure that I covered all the, the things I was going to talk about and I had a really good idea of what I was going to talk about. That way, when I went there, I was prepared and I had a good speech. If I didn't prioritize the speech, I would just show up and wing it. This is how we treat our sleep. We treat our sleep like something that's just going to happen. We mm -hmm. completely take for granted that the state that you go into your sleep matters a lot and is mm -hmm. going to make a big difference on your sleep. So if you're go, 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 electronic lights on all the way up until the second you close your eyes and you expect your body and your brain to mm -hmm. fall right asleep, mm -hmm. it's not going to happen unless you're completely exhausted. Because I know there's some people listening right now who are like, I only get five hours of sleep, but I go right to sleep because yeah. you're, you're exhausted. You're just exhausted. You're, you're beyond the threshold of that. You are. Yeah. So you want to treat it like anything else that you prioritize. So what does that mean? Two hours before you go to bed, Prepare your body and your mind for sleep. Get off yeah. electronics. This man. is a huge thing for me too because, like, I didn't even realize like how wound up I still was before I would go to sleep, and that, and then you know, taking the time to really you know prepare yourself mentally for sleep was like it, it sounds crazy, but um, you know, to be able to not just like you know eliminate a lot of the blue light and all of these electronics, obviously that's going to help, but. Uh, to kind of prepare yourself mentally to calm down. There's two different states, and I felt them specifically. I know now uh, the difference of when, you know, I'm in this heightened alert, like, you know, fight or flight type state, which uh, is, is a very common state that people just carry throughout the entire day and then expect to just sleep. And exactly. Then, so, you know, it, it's a training process. It, a lot of times you hear people talk about meditation. They talk about, uh, you know, awareness or like all these like woo-woo terms out there. Uh, but really what they're just trying to get you to experience something that you're probably not even feeling right now. And, and that's really the state that you need to be concerned with in order to fully recover and recharge your battery to then, you know, develop, uh, you know, a, a better metabolism yep. and to build muscle. Yeah, well, uh, the what? blue light thing was a, a game changer oh, for yeah. me because there was a, a major duh moment for me when I figured out like, oh, wow. Yeah. For most of human history, we didn't have artificial light. Yeah, the and, sun went down. And the sun <laughs> is what told us it's time to, to rest and recover, you know, which depending on what time of the year it is, it's going down somewhere between 6 and 8 p.m. at night at the latest, right? So here I am, you know, and we live in this time now where we're underneath these artificial blue lights all the time. We have these laptops and computers. We have these badass big screen TVs. We got these smartphones now and social media. And then you add in too, like you, what your your point, Justin, about the the fight or flight type of stress uh, that just we, with your your mindset and where you're at. And man, I, you watch a you watch a scary movie or you watch something that is like a, a action packed you know Netflix series that you're all into, and it's nine o'clock at night. Yeah. And then before you go to bed, you, not a good idea. you check your Instagram, and some haters got on there and said some shit to you. Like all those things, aside from the light sending a signal to the brain saying, "Hey, it's still daytime." Aside from that, then you add in all the other the things that you're actually watching, and the brain is downloading. And then you go like, "Oh, it's ten or 11. It's time for me to shut down and rest and recover." Get the fuck 
fuck out of here. It's not to mention, I mean, waking up like like for me, I used to have anxiety about waking up. I didn't even know I had anxiety about it. It's because of the shock factor. It's the like I I would (laughs) anticipate my alarm clock going off and I would wake up three hours before my alarm clock would turn off. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like just being able to address that and find a better way to even wake up was huge. Well, and we just it's it's funny because it's like anything else. You know, if it's really important, anything in our lives, uh, you prioritize things and you make efforts and you and you create rituals around. And it's, you know, sleep for so long has just been kind of an afterthought. Mm-hmm. It's like, I'll sleep when I'm tired. My body will just, I'll pass out. I'll natural versus, whoa, this is something that's really, really important. I mean, look at the, especially in our industry and in fitness, look at the rituals around getting ready to work out. I mean, you got your gym bag, you got your shaker cup, you take your pre-workout, you, you play your Metallica music before you get ready, you yeah, your strap- Your headband, your you, wristband. Yeah, you strap in your fucking weightlifting shoes, you get the wristband going, you freaking prime <laughs> the body, you do a warm up. I mean, Jesus, yeah. there is a whole mm-hmm. host of things. Yeah, I got my shreds tank, and, I'm ready to go. And that same thing carries over into a sporting event. If you're a basketball player, a football player, look at all the rituals that are before you go to game time. But- if you knew that sleep was as important or arguably more important than these things, and yet you have no rituals or you have no good habits that you've put in place to optimize that, man, what a game changer when I figured that piece out and how important that was for me to teach my clients. Oh, and sleep requires more ritual than uh, activity. And here's why. Sleeping is probably the most vulnerable thing that humans do ever Anytime. So mm-hmm. if, if you're, you think, imagine again, 5,000 years ago, at what point are you, you're most vulnerable to attack yeah, by, and mm-hmm. you're, you're unconscious. Well, duh, when you're unconscious, it's night. You can't see very well at night. So if you don't get good sleep, first off, if you're stressed by, for at all, your body's not going to let you go to sleep. It's not going to let, because imagine if you're like running away from a, from a predator or something and it's dark and you're really, really tired, but you know he's kind of out there. Your body is going to try to keep you awake. Well, that's what happens when you're going to bed, stressed out, lights on, turn them off, and you expect yourself to shut down. It ain't going to happen. So, so here's a couple things. First off, and here's some, some tangibles. First off, aim for seven to eight hours of, of sleep. That is what we found to be the ideal amount of sleep for most people. So give yourself, so know what time you need to wake up. Give yourself seven to eight hours before that. That's the time that you should be in bed and go to sleep. Now, two hours before that is when you start to get ready for bed. Now, that doesn't mean that you, you you know, you lay there in a dark room and you do all that stuff. You don't have to go that that crazy at all. But here's a couple things you, you should probably do. The All light, all light tells the brain that it probably shouldn't be asleep. But there's two different types of light that have the biggest effect on the brain. The first one is blue light. That's what blue light blocking glasses help you get rid of. So you can wear those. Um, The second one is green light, which is also present in electronics uh, and in sunlight. And then the, the type of light that affects you the least is red light. Now, why do you think humans evolved to not be negatively impacted by red light? A fire. A fire. Because the only kind of light we evolved having late at night or during the evening or whatever was fire. So here's what I like to do. I have put in my house- Candles, right? Him, candles or Himalayan salt lamps. So candles are great, but the problem with candles, you have to replace them all the time. So I And, and it's a flame, right? I put Himalayan salt lamps. Now, Himalayan salt lamps, just Himalayan salt. There's a bulb inside. You turn it on. It's a red glow. It's wonderful. And so at two hours before bed, and it's enough light to where you can see what you're doing and stuff like that. So in my house, that's what we have two hours before bed. And we continue our normal stuff. I'm hanging out with the kids and maybe I'll read a book. I like to turn off electronics. I like to try and read. If I do watch electronics, I put on my blue light blocking glasses to get rid of that. I make sure that all the stressful stuff that I've done for the whole day has been done. Two hours before bed, it's when I shut down the stressful shit. That's when the conversations that if I want to have a tough conversation with my girlfriend, then I'll make sure I schedule it before two hours before. Of course, shit happens. But again, you're not going to be perfect every single Don't time. Don't talk about finances uh, right before bed. No, 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 no. Not, <laughs> not at a all. good idea. It's terrible. Yeah. So take your time and prioritize it and watch what you will be blown away. When I started doing this with clients, I couldn't believe it. I looked at their food intake after a few weeks of doing this. 
They started eating healthier. They, they noticed less, less cravings. Cravings are different than hunger. They noticed less cravings. Many times cravings are due to stress or your body's trying to get a quick jolt of feel good because your body feels like shit. So you'll reach for the you know, hedonistic, highly palatable processed food. I noticed they were eating healthier. Of course, I noticed better performance in the gym, stronger, more stamina. For the clients that I did have that would monitor things like hormones, uh, I noticed men's testosterone levels going up. I noticed my female clients would have a be better balance of progesterone to estrogen. Um, I just noticed all these incredible things that were happening to them. And of course, they felt better, had more energy, and they were more productive throughout the whole day. Here's a myth I would love to just smash. For those of you thinking, oh, I can't get eight hours of sleep because I'm a a hustler and I got to work. And so I only, you know, want to, okay. You, if you get good sleep, you'll be far more productive during the hours you're awake and you actually be more that productive. That is a fact. That's a fact. That's an absolute fact. You'll be more productive with less time than you were before when you were just grinding it and out. You'll look way less like a zombie. <laughs> Absolutely. So sleep is extremely important. Schedule it two hours before blue light blocking glasses uh, are, are great. Even better. Turn everything off. Go by kind of red light or a low glow. Um, and oh, cool room. Make sure your room is really cool. Here's another one that's interesting. I read a study that showed that people who sleep almost naked or naked have consistently uh, better sleep. I think it has to do with the, the body temperature. Mm. So this is what I do now. I go I go to bed and I just sleep in my my underwear. You guys know that. I send you guys pictures. Yeah. Uh, and it works. And conducting your own experiments. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I've been sleeping like, naked forever. Yeah. Have you been for a long time? Oh, yeah, a long time. Yeah, I've yeah. always been a naked I guy. I can't do that. Not completely. Mm -hmm. I'm a boxer yeah. guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and, and prioritize that and then combine that with a good traditional strength training program where you're trying to get stronger. For most of you, this is going to be about three days a week in the gym, full body. You're doing straight sets. And then take your calories, figure out your maintenance calories, Bump them up very, very slowly between 50 to 150 calories a week. Watch the scale. If it doesn't go up or it goes up just a little bit and you're getting stronger and you're getting good sleep, you're on the right track and stay on this path until you're at the point where you're like, wow, I'm eating a, de a decent amount of food. My metabolism feels good. I'm really strong. I think I could start cutting now and be happy with where I end up settling with my caloric intake. And if you do that, the, your, the, the, the odds of your long-term success, way, way higher. In fact, in my experience, the only clients I've ever worked with who've had real long-term success are the ones that took this approach. And with that, if you go to mindpumpfree.com, you can download any of our guides for free. You can also check us all out on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.